Today I'm here to talk to you about the beauty in thinking and how you can learn new things without any new information using what's already inside your head. I'd like to first ask you, what is money? Can you take just 10 seconds to come up with a good answer inside your head of what money really is? All right, I'll assume you have some kind of an answer. Before the advent of money, economies focused primarily on bartering. I teach math, for example. I would have to know how many math lessons I need to trade you to feed my family tonight. I would need to have to know how many math lessons I trade for a new pair of shoes, for a new car, for a house payment, for all the different things in our economy that have to be paid for one way or another. If my line of work is by teaching math lessons, then that's what I have to use to buy all these other supplies. Take a look at a picture of a barter system. Here we have conversions between pigs and shoes and cars and meals and rooftops and major appliances and, of course, math lessons. But what happens when I need to buy 30 different items to remodel my home? Well, I, either I have to sit around and work out exactly how many math lessons I have to teach to whom to make sure that they're going to come by and render their work on my home, or we need an intermediary. Money itself is actually only an index. It's a conversion factor used so that all I have to know about my math lessons is what they're worth in one measurement, money. I can take that money then and go convert it to anything I want, which has a price tag. And as you know, in this country, everything has a price tag. The power of this is that it makes it so I don't have to really know much beyond the value that society places on what I offer. That's very powerful because it means I can get anything the economy has to offer without having to work out a particular relative price. So money is very powerful in enabling us to use our economy to the most optimal levels. Now let's talk about cost. When you talk about cost, I would say that's a concept that goes way beyond just the price of an item. I pay $1.82 for a light bulb, for example. But when I think about cost, I think about how much of the earth had to be destroyed to get it, how much fuel was wasted processing it, how much fuel was spent delivering it to wherever it was I was going to buy it from. And on top of all that, what about the packaging material, how much waste is generated? The cost of an object includes also the opportunity cost of what else you could do. For example, a $737 million B-2 bomber could probably feed a lot of homeless people. Here is my incandescent light bulb example. Thankfully, we're moving away from these. But if you look, it costs you $1.82. The price of a light bulb includes tungsten, glass, other kinds of metals, wires, solder, insulators. There's a lot of little pieces, plus it's filled with a gas. Here's a quick chart showing a little anatomy of a light bulb. I got this from Wikipedia. You can see a very basic design, but there's also a lot of parts that go in there. Try to imagine how those parts are made. You don't just go somewhere and dig up a piece of glass out of the ground. You have to melt down sand or something. Lots and lots of heat is generated. So here are some things hidden in the $1.82 price tag that you never have to think about. And unfortunately, you're a less informed consumer because you spend money and you don't have to know about these things. I put a various number of pluses subjectively on how much different impact these have, the tungsten for the light bulb's filament, the glass required to wrap it, the other metals used for conducting electricity, and the gas that it has to be filled with. You'll notice glass takes a lot of heat. It takes a lot of heat. It releases a lot of carbon dioxide to make that gas. Tungsten as well. Tungsten has to be heated to some 850 degrees centigrade for a while in a bath of pure hydrogen to get purified tungsten. There's a lot of energy used in doing this. This is my suggestion. Why don't we have a total cost price tag on our objects. It'll show how much water is destroyed, how much heat is released, how much of the earth is processed to make it. And if you imagine three cubic feet, it's a good fish tank, one foot wide, three feet long, and another foot tall. That's how much earth they have to destroy to get one light bulb. It's a lot of earth. Secondly, another thing I've been thinking about is GMOs. All of the things we see about GMOs in the news are about food. And I've got to tell you, food is the only way that we live. We don't have a second source of food, so if we poison our food supply, we're doomed. I'd like to direct your attention away from using GMOs for food. How about instead for raw materials? Let's say you need a good source of cheap sheet plastic, but fossil fuels keep getting more expensive, and making that plastic also gets more expensive. What if you could teach a plant to just secrete the plastic in raw form, ready to go? This can absolutely be done with genetic modification, but we're so caught up on making our corn grow a little bit taller that we've never once thought about it. Finally, before I go, I'd like to invite you to consider building your next building project into the ground halfway. If you have a 30-floor building and it goes straight up, first of all, you're anchoring it several floors down anyway, but secondly, there's a lot of pumping to get stuff up, to get stuff down. There's also a huge, essentially desert, 
where you put your building. Now, if you dug it down into the ground, you could use the weight of the things on the top floors to lift up the things on the bottom floors. On top of that, it would be much easier to cover over with earth, plants, grasses, anything that would actually decrease the amount of rooftop desertification we have to deal with. So as you can see, these are fairly immature thoughts, but for how immature they are, I love thinking about these things. I'd like to close by reminding you of one very interesting fact about today's kids. About half of them love to think. They're be the problem solvers, they're going to be the inventors. The other half of the kids, if you go into a classroom and say, hey, raise your hand, do you guys like to think? You're going to see a very small percentage of hands come up in most cases. We're lucky to be in this area where most of the hands come up, but we have got to be teaching our children to think. Think for yourself. Thank you.